Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast, episode 114. Before we get going, I wanted to draw your attention to a brand new fiction release from Cannonball Books. The Babylon Bee's very own Ethan Nicole has officially released his very first illustrated novel, Brave Ollie Possum. Ollie Macarelli is determined to face his fear of the dark once and for all, but he gets more than he bargained for when his therapist turns out to be an actual monster. To make it even worse, Ollie is transformed from a boy to a possum and locked in a cage. With no way to call for help, Ollie must learn to be brave with the help of some furry friends, or he will be the main course. Adventurous, imaginative, and fantastically illustrated, Brave Ollie Possum is the debut children's story from author and screenwriter Ethan Nicole. Brave Ollie Possum releases October 29th, but get it at canonpress.com for 10% off with the pre-order. Cheers. Welcome to Plodcast, episode 114. Plodcast, episode 114. So, as um, as I'm recording this, we are sort of in the very beginning stages of, well, I won't say beginning, well, I, I was going to call this impeachment uh, madness, impeachment madness. And we're not really in the beginning stages of impeachment madness. We're in the beginning stages of the third act of impeachment uh, madness. As I'm recording this, um, uh, the uh, Washington establishment, the ruling elites, the deep state aficionados, and various media types have gotten themselves whipped up into a meringue about uh, President Trump's phone call to the president of Ukraine, and they want to impeach him. So uh, I want to talk a little bit. I'm not talking about the um, the transcript of that phone call or what was. I'm not going to get into the Biden stuff and whether Trump was trying to dig dig up dirt on Biden or whether there is any dirt to be dug, which there which there is. Um, that's not the uh, that's not my interest. I want to talk a little bit about the um, about the madness of what the Democrats are doing, um, uh, given their root assumptions. So what? Uh, what is it they're doing? I just want to I just want to talk for a moment about the madness of this entire process. So, first a civics lesson: when a president is impeached, there have only been two presidents who have been impeached: um, Andrew Johnson, right after the Civil War, and Bill Clinton. Uh, they were impeached. Impeachment is not the same thing as conviction. This is the here's the basic civics lesson. A a politician, let's say the inhabitant of the White House, is impeached when the House of Representatives in effect indicts him. So um, uh, when when a president is impeached, that simply means there is going to be a trial. It does not mean that the trial is over. It does not mean that he is convicted. It means that he is, there's, he's going to go to trial. So someone who's arrested, someone who's accused of a crime, someone who's indicted, uh, that's, all that tells you is that there's going to be a trial. In our political system, the House of Representatives, if we're talking about the president, the House of Representative, Representatives indicts. They say there's, there's enough here to uh, warrant a trial. And they therefore impeach the president. It then goes to trial. When it goes to trial, in effect, the United States Senate serves as the jury. The United States Senate serves as the jury, and the Supreme Court, uh, the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, in this case John Roberts, would um, would preside over that trial in the Senate. In order to impeach the president, you've got to get a, uh, I think it's over 60 votes. You've got to, it's not a bare majority. You've got to get a lot of votes in order to convict. So if the House of Representatives indicted the president, 
And then it went to trial in the Senate. The Senate heard the uh, heard all the evidence that's laid out and did its own investigation, in effect, um, and then voted. And they voted with a strong majority to convict. At that point, the uh, president would be removed from office. Okay, so that's how the impeachment process works. Two times in the history of the United States, well over two centuries, two times a president has been indicted, uh, Andrew Johnson right after the Civil War, and Bill Clinton back in the day. Neither of them were convicted. So both of them went to trial, and neither of them were convicted, and they finished their term as president. Now, if you are a member of the hard left, um, in the House of Representatives, I think this has to be seen. If uh, this would have to be seen uh, by the rest of us observing the hard left as something of a hail mary pass, uh, they're they're putting everything into this. They've only got a little bit of time left, and they're they're going for it. What do I mean? Well, let's start with the end of the process. Assuming they run the table, assuming that they successfully get everything they want. They get the president impeached, that is indicted, and then it goes to trial. And let's say that the Senate convicts him. Um, What have they accomplished? Well, they've accomplished President Pence. That's what they've, that's what they've done. They've, um, (laughs) why all this uh, froth and bubble uh, for that result? All right, that's one thing. Secondly, This is a political process beginning to end. It's sheer politics, but it's structured as though it were an objective judicial setting. In other words, the Senate is serving as the jury, and there's a there's a trial and evidence presented and all of all of that. So there's an indictment that comes out of the House. They present their evidence to the Senate. The Senate weighs the evidence, and then they vote. Well, the House is currently um, dominated by the um, dominated by the Democrats, and the uh, Senate is dominated by the Republicans. This is not going to go away. Once, you, if you if you manage to get an indictment, um, it it's going to go over to the Senate, and there's no no conceivable way that the Senate is going to vote to convict a sitting president of their own political party. It's just simply not going to happen. Um, so why are you doing, you know, why are you doing this? It's, it's, this seems to me to be a concerted effort to reelect President Trump uh, move. Then the last thing that, that people aren't thinking through, uh, so basically what's going to happen is you're, they're, they're trying to remove the president. They're trying to overturn the results of the last election which is going to get everybody to come out of the woodwork in support of the president in the flyover states um, to rally around him and say, look, look at what the deep, these deep state operatives are doing to our president. We need to rally the flag boys. And I think it's going to be a very strong election for President Trump. I've read one observer who thinks it's going to be um, uh, like a landslide. If this kind of craziness uh, keeps up, it's, it's going to be uh, a landslide. Here's the last thing. When, when the whole thing goes to trial, um, let's, let's say it gets to the Senate, and we have a, a, an impeachment, and they're uh, investigating the president, this means that anything, absolutely anything, that has been obliquely related to this can be um, summoned up and entered into these court proceedings. In other words, the Senate, controlled by the Republicans, can call, they can do anything they want. They can call Joe Biden and put him under oath. They can call Hunt, they can they can call anybody in the Biden family, put them under oath. They can call up Hillary Clinton, put her under oath. They can uh, call up James Comey, put him under oath. They they've got open field running. They can, <laughs> and I just don't think that the um, I just don't think that the 
Democrats have really thought this one through. So here on podcast episode 114, uh, we come now to our hamartiology section. Um, our word for our word this go round is apasuko, apasuko, and it's this word is used just one time in the New Testament, and it refers to a failure of heart, failure of heart. Uh, the place where it occurs is in Luke twenty one twenty six, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming to on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So we're discussing various words used in the New Testament um, for different kinds of sins. Hamartias is the word for sin, and hamartiology, we're studying sin. And so it might seem slightly off to include this one. I mean, when the powers of heaven are shaken, whose heart wouldn't fail them? Whose, whose heart wouldn't uh, uh, quail a little bit, right? Men's hearts failing them. Is that really a sin? But we're told in Scripture that God's people should take heart whenever they see the judgments of God approaching. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. So when the heart fails, as here, it is a sinful response in the midst of judgments falling down on other sins. So when God brings his judgments to bear on the sinful lifestyle of a people, and those people uh, collapse, those people um, quail in fear, that itself is a sinful response to this uh, uh, judgment for sin. It's possible for a sinful man, it, it should be remembered that it's possible for a sinful man to approach a holy God with boldness. It would not be possible apart from the gospel, but since the gospel has been established and has openly been declared to us, we have no excuse for not coming with boldness. So in Hebrews 4.16, for example, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And there's something striking about that. Coming boldly to what kind of throne? A throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy. Well, when do we need mercy? Well, we need mercy when we've screwed up. We need mercy when we don't deserve mercy. And the author of Hebrews tells us that when we are in need of mercy, we need to come to the throne of grace. How? Boldly. So when God's judgments fall, if you're in Christ, uh, there's no need to have a failure of heart. When God's judgments are coming, um, God is coming to vindicate his word and his people, and we can rejoice. Um, God's people throughout the Psalms, when God comes to judge the earth, that's the response, bring, breaking forth into song. So, apasuko, failure of heart, in this context, in this one usage, uh, yes, it is a sin. So the book I want to talk about, uh, this, this podcast, this episode, which is, incidentally, 114, is uh, Civil Rights, Rhetoric or Reality by Thomas Sowell. Civil Rights, Rhetoric, or Reality. Uh, now, Thomas Sowell is one of my favorite uh, writers on economics. He is uh, dedicated to the truth. He's dedicated to what the facts point to and not what some political agenda um, might seem to require. Um, he is, uh, he's retired now, but he's a black economist. He's a black man. And as a black man, he has all kinds of uh, sympathy, all kinds of uh, agreement, principled agreement with the stated goals of the original civil rights movement. The original civil rights movement genuinely was a civil rights movement. But as Sowell points out in this book, uh, that movement was uh, promptly shanghaied and taken off uh, to serve the cause of progressivism, leftism, liberalism, and whatnot. In other words, if you have two citizens, one white and one black, and you put a poll tax on uh, all black citizens such that they've got to pay $1,000 to vote, 
and you're you're discouraging the vote that way. You're discouraging the black vote that way. That's a civil rights issue. Or if you just simply ban, uh, you, you, if you deny blacks the right to vote, that's a civil rights issue. If you don't let blacks ride on public transport, that is a civil rights issue. Uh, so all of those things, uh, Seoul was very, um, like I said, sympathetic. But when you get into other things like rent control or minimum wage laws or affirmative action, uh, these things are, are often touted as civil rights issues, and they are pushed by so-called civil rights leaders, but they're not civil rights at all. Um, and to the extent that they land on the black population, they land on the black population negatively. So, uh, so what happened is, let, let's say you had a, a situation where there really was genuine voter suppression and blacks didn't get to vote, and there was a series of reforms that resulted in the same percentage of black citizens voting as white citizens vote, and, um, and there's no coercion or anything like that. That is genuinely a civil rights issue, and a civil rights activist could take legitimate pride in how he worked for civil rights. But let's say that civil rights activist um, has studied voting patterns, and he works very hard to get blacks to be able to vote. But he has not studied economics, and so he then moves his neck for his, you know, for my next magic trick, for my next uh, thing that I'm going to do in the name of civil rights. I'm going to agitate for a minimum wage law because I've seen a lot of black people in this state; they're just impoverished. They can't afford anything. Um, they, they 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 live at a lower standard of living than their white neighbors across town, and so what we need to do is we need to jack up the minimum uh, wage. And that way, um, they'll be able to they'll they'll start earning a decent wage, and they'll uh, will achieve parity of income. Um, well, uh, what actually happened that that's the intention. Instead of saying, "Hey, you can't suppress the black vote; you've got to let blacks vote too," and then actually succeeding in uh, accomplishing that, where you have a genuine advance in civil rights, what you've done now is you have made unskilled black teenagers unemployable uh, because their work, let's say they don't have any skills, they, their work is not worth $15 an hour. And you've, you either have necessitated black teenagers uh, in the inner city who have few marketable skills, they must either be hired illegally and paid under the table, or what more uh, likely is going to happen, they are just going to be unemployed. They're going to be left out of work. And so what you've done, instead of when, you, uh, when you're an activist wanting blacks to get the vote or blacks not to have their voting interfered with, and when you're done, they can vote without interference, that's a genuine civil rights achievement. But what kind of achievement is it if through your economic nincompoopery, you throw all the black teenagers out of work and prevent them from gaining marketable skills for another few years. What, who are you benefiting? And why on earth would anybody let you call that civil rights? Well, what Thomas Sowell does in this book is he takes all sorts of things like that, uh, things that are done on behalf of the poor, in the name of the poor, in the name of black, uh, in the, you know, for the sake of the black children, um, and takes them apart and shows how they don't achieve the stated effect, or, uh, as is often the case, they have a contrary effect. They take uh, the people they're supposed to be helping in the opposite direction. God don't never change. He's God. You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.